The Art of Being Ruled. Wyndham Lewis. Original Publication 1926. 1989 Edition. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Part 13. Beyond Action and Reaction. Chapter 4. How Much Truth Does a Man Require? Sorel draws our attention to what he affirms is the importance of the anticipatory spirit by a quotation from von Hartmann. The melancholy which is spread like a presentiment over all the masterpieces of Greek art, in spite of the life with which they seem to overflow, is witness that individuals of genius, even in that period, were in a condition to penetrate the illusions of life, to which the genius of their age abandoned itself without experiencing the need to control them. And Sorel comments on this to the effect that there are few doctrines more important for the understanding of history than that of anticipation, reminding us of Newman's use of it in his researches in the history of dogmas. This melancholy presentiment of the truth, that the tragic drama possessed in Greece, enabling it to tear aside the veil of illusion, as Shakespeare did so terribly in our own time, was a possession, in both senses of that word, not shared by Greek philosophy as a whole. Heraclitus, the dark, the weeping, philosopher, owned it. But the Platonists were busy, as in their capacity of teachers and healers they were bound to be, with happier pictures. The artist's truth is in this way the deeper and more terrible. His classical tragic task of providing a catharsis, his diabolical relay of getting as near to destruction and terror as that is possible without impairing the organism, requires of him a very different disposition to that of the philosopher. When the tragic artist takes life in hand for representation, secondary characteristics disappear as he manipulates it. It is at life itself, rather than at our particular social life of the moment, that his terrible processes are directed. His truth, if it were not deadened by a rhythmical enchantment, would annihilate us. But the philosopher, he who is responsible for the utopias, although he may have his presentiments as well, is typically engaged in bestowing life, not in pretending to take it away, however salutary that threat may be in the event. He heals the wounds inflicted by natural science, or tries to, dovetails his midwifery with the purges of the more terrible form of artist, investigates life's gentler and nobler possibilities with the serener sort of artist. So he defines his discursive functions, showing himself as indispensable as the dock leaf is for the nettle, and claiming to stand between man and the artist, as well as between man and the man of science. He is the lover, his wisdom or system his carefully collected nest. That our contemporaries have an aversion, as Sorel says, to every pessimistic idea is indisputable. But what people have not had. He means, however, that they refuse to take on even so much of the harsh truth as is necessary for life's bare preservation. But they get their truth all right, in spite of themselves. Mechanically it reaches them, without their knowing how by way of the vulgarization of scientific thought. They actually get much too much, far more than what would be a suitable ration. It is plainly the popularization of science that is responsible for the fever and instability apparent on all sides. To withhold knowledge from people, or to place unassimilable knowledge in their hands, are both equally effective, if you wish to render them helpless. As Einstein is reported as saying in conversation, the characteristic danger to human society is that the outstripping intellect will destroy the backward mass of men by imposing a civilization on it for which it is not ready. The question, of course, remains if it will ever be ready. That is the capital question where its destiny is concerned. It is on the answer to that that all political thought must repose. What has been suggested in the foregoing pages is that ample evidence has been accumulated by now that men, ace a whole, will never be ready. Instead of sitting down and abusing them as the man of the type of Robert Burton does, or as Professor Richet has just done, and as have numbers of other philosophers, ecclesiastics, etc., in the past, and instead of fixing an eye of hatred on them, and deciding that they must die, as Swift did, or coolly blasting them, with the gesture, oddly enough, of benediction, as Mr. Shaw does with Ozymandias, a quite different course, luckily, today presents itself. In 1849 Lang wrote, should it not be clear to every reasonable man that civilized Europe must enter into one great political community? Earlier Gouda was a constant advocate of a world state, and of the suppression of nationality. In other words, he was an internationalist. Today, in spite of very great efforts to artificially preserve national frontiers, these frontiers being a more disreputable farce than at any former period, automatically, the automatic defeating conscious strategy most plainly in this instance, internationalism is becoming a fact. The standardizing of giant industry and its international character will have it so, in spite of the international industrialists. When all Russians wore beards and all Americans were clean-shaven, it was much more easy to make them believe, respectively, that they were of different clay. But nationality is the one thing that cannot be manufactured. Once you have destroyed, or allowed to be destroyed, 
the ancient customs and arts of a country, you cannot reimpose them. The maypole or jack of the green in the council school festivity is too evident a lie, it is like a sphinx in St. Paul's, or a Carthaginian galley on the spree. There is today a new reality, it is its first appearance in terrestrial life, the fact of political world control. Today this may be said to be in existence, and tomorrow it will be still more of a fact. Neither can it be hidden, short of destroying everybody's sense of reality altogether. People no doubt could be persuaded that they did not see the sun and moon, but the effort to assimilate this gigantic lie would destroy their brains altogether, and universal imbecility would ensue. Thereby the whole problem of government is altered. New methods are suggested that formerly circumstances did not allow people even to imagine. With a world state and a recognized central world control, argument about the ethics of war would become absurd. More profitable occupations could then be found for everybody. In a society organized on a world basis, revolution would not be encouraged, either, any more than today it is encouraged in fascist Italy or Soviet Russia. The idea for which Professor Perry stands, that of the comparatively recent growth of war, and of the fundamentally pacific nature of man, when not trained or organized as a fighting machine, for it is only as a machine, even, that he can fight, by himself he is not very pugnacious or brave, is supported by a great deal of very good evidence. And there seems no reason at present why this period of chaotic wastefulness should not be regarded as drawing to a close. In order to wind it up, further wars and revolutions may occur. But they are not any longer necessary. There is no even political excuse for them. There may soon therefore no longer be any reason for the despairing philosopher to inquire, who made so soft and peaceable a creature, born to love mercy, meekness, so to rave, rage like wild beasts, and run on to their own destruction. How may nature expostulate with mankind, I made thee a harmless, quiet, a divine creature. Etc. For we know quite well what makes such a soft and peaceable creature into a warrior, it is his rulers in the course of their competitive careers who effect this paradoxical transformation in their extremely soft subjects. If all competition were eliminated, both as between the small man and the big, and respectively between the several great ones of this earth, then this soft and peaceable, or mad, careless, and stupid, creature would be spared the gymnastics required to turn him into a man-eating tiger. It is also absurd, and even wicked, to attempt to turn him into a philosopher. He should be left alone and allowed to lead a peaceful, industrious, and pleasant life, for we all as men belong to each other. The optimism of Socratic thought might even be rehabilitated, and not seem so aggravating as Sorel found it. His serene picture, without coming true, might no longer enrage, the presentiments of the prophets and artists could be taken or left, left by most people, who would hum and buzz as monotonously and peaceably through their life as even the most fortunate be. Those who had a taste for other forms of life, or who were bred, by means of eugenics, to a different existence, would not rage against their soft and peaceable fellow man as formerly. For every one would be perfectly satisfied.